Hey guys, this is Tho Bishop with Radio Rothbard, and I want to let you guys know about another great Mises event we have coming up on November 4th in Fort Myers, Florida. As you know, everyday Americans feel the political capture of the economy. Inflation, taxes, and regulatory costs hit our paychecks and our savings. The regulatory capture of the medical industries, food and energy production, and the various instruments of big tech empower the regime with new tools to promote their latest ideological cause. The ever-growing burden of government debt has become a crisis without any political will to address it. We're going to be talking about these very issues at this event in Fort Myers. And best of all, we have a discount code for Radio Rothbard listeners. If you use promo code RR2023, RR as in Radio Rothbard, 2023, you'll get $10 off at this event. If you want to learn more, visit Mises.org slash FL2023. FL is in Florida. Look forward to seeing you there. Hello and welcome back to Radio Rothbard. I'm Ryan McMakin, executive editor with the Mises Institute, and I'm here with my co-host, Tho Bishop, and we are going to talk today about Congress and the budget battle and a little bit about Speaker McCarthy's unseating former Speaker McCarthy which is really actually fairly remarkable. But really what we're going to talk about here is, does this make any difference? Um, Does the McCarthy thing make any difference? What's going to be the end of this budget battle? And if you've been around for a while, I mean, if you're a Mises Institute listener, you're probably sufficiently jaded at this point, right? You're you're, you're not clueless enough to get your hopes up. There's going to be some major reform to the federal government, and we're all going to be uh, cutting taxes and spending from now on. So what I want to learn from Tho, really, is Tho, as a Rothbardian Mises reader sort of person who is uh, generally contemptuous of news out of Washington, and we don't take anything for uh, face value in terms of how it's being reported, and and we know that uh, reports of um, the power of the swamp being crushed are all probably extremely overstated. Really, what what should our takeaways be here on the current budget battle? Like, is is there anything specific that that's good that might actually result, or are we just waiting it out like we have uh, ten previous budget battles where it's all just business as usual afterward? Or is there is there anything new and remarkable here, or is it just more of the same? Well, the lead up to the overthrow of the McCarthy regime, that was the shortest termed uh, speakership since 1876. It always comes back to 1876. Um, The result, the build up to it was Washington functioning exactly as it has for 25 years, right? You had build up of conservatives promising, oh, we're going to cut spending, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. They weren't able to get anything passed through their caucus. And we can talk about what the kind of the the objections within, um, because you had people like Thomas Massey on one side, right? Usually someone we we view as better member of of Congress than most. You had people like Matt Gates who led the charge on another side. Um, But ultimately, the result was predictable. The Congress does what it does very well. It kicked the can down the road. It passed a continuing resolution for 45 days that maintained spending levels at what was already in place, right? It was just a pure kick the can down the road moment. It had um, more votes from Democrats than Republicans. Again, that worked to McCarthy's, um, against McCarthy when it came to the battle over speakership. And Congress functioned exactly as we expect it to. Um, And ultimately, this was always going to be the result, right? The Senate was not going to agree to anything significant. Uh, McCarthy, one of the selling points he made on the CR was that they removed Ukraine funding from the bill, but he also made a side deal with the Senate that, hey, look, we're going to put up Ukraine funding immediately. And actually, that played a role into what happened this week because, in theory, um, your Congress was not supposed to be in session this week. They were scheduled to be out of session. He kept 
Congress in session, though, so that this additional deal could be voted through. And that allowed for Matt Gates to file his motion to vacate the chair immediately afterwards, where kind of the, the, the feelings were still raw. Um, because again, you, you had a, a, a decent amount, I think it was 90 plus Republican members, again, far more than the people that voted against Kevin McCarthy. They voted against McCarthy's continuing resolution um, because, I mean, for one, it was easy to do so because there was enough Democrat support. You didn't have to be the deciding vote. So if that allows for a certain sort of theater within that. Um, but that was the lead up to it. Um, now, if we go back to kind of the prologue to all this, which was the 15 rounds of speakership votes, right, that, uh, that made Kevin McCarthy Speaker of the House for a short period of time, one of the promises that was made, and this was something that people like Thomas Massey had been fighting for for a very long time, this is one of the rules that was pushed forward to kind of restrain McCarthy, was a promise that there was gonna be a return to uh, the proper procedure for dealing with the appropriations project uh, process, which is having 12 individual spending votes on various aspects of the government, right? So, you know, the Department of Labor would be handled differently than military budget, than education, et cetera, right? That is the way that Congress was supposed to operate, had been more or less operating up to the mid-90s. Since the mid-90s, all the budget deals have been, you know, in, with kind of consolidated together, what's called an omnibus package, right? So there's very little debate on specific issues. This allows for spending to kind of just continue you know, there's, there's, without any debate, spending levels just keep going up and up and up. It's a path of least resistance, which is why it's been so beloved within Washington. And so that was where the spending battle lines were drawn. On the one side, you had people like Matt Gates pounding the table saying anything short of dealing, breaking up these spending bills was unacceptable. You had pe people like Thomas Massey on the other side, where one of the proposed short-term solutions was a continuing resolution with certain cuts in spending um, growth baked into the pie there. And so, you know, I, I can sympathize with, with both arguments. Hey, look, let's pass this, some, let's, let's pass this, this short-term thing that has something resembling, um, you know, spending cuts over, you know, it was, it, you know, better than what happened, right? The other side saying, well, spending levels are less important than the process because if we don't return the process, then we're not going to be able to have any longer lasting conversations here. And so that's what divided, you know, what we might call the, the physically conservative members of the House. So that's why that original continuation, the continue re resolution package, which again, was never going to pass the Senate anyway, that's why that failed, led to this dysfunction that created this bipartisan agreement um, to kick the can down the road without any changes. And this was kind of the build up to the drama with the motion to vacate, um, which again, the first time a Speaker of the House has been removed from that position um, through kind of a, an up and down vote, kind of a, you know, basically a vote of no confidence, um, which again, we see all the time in kind of European parliaments, first time it's ever happened within the American project. Well, and I know that one significant part of this has been uh, funding for Ukraine, for the U.S.'s uh, involvement in the war there. And so from what I've seen is that the Senate, of course, obviously in favor of plenty of Ukraine spending, but that uh, the certain Republican activists are against it. it. I assume that McCarthy was all about just cutting a deal to keep the Ukraine money going. And so, so how does that work out in the end? I, I could see the House voting repeatedly to cut the Ukraine funding and then just the Senate rejecting it over and over again. I mean, was, is, there any, <laughs> is, is there any end game here, here for that? Or where are we going to end up with Ukraine funding? Well, it's been interesting watching the House conference kind of change over time on this issue. Because when in the early rounds of Ukraine funding came up, there were members of Congress, I think it was about 20 something votes. Um, so you had Matt Gates, you had Marjorie Taylor Greene, you had Thomas Massey, you had, um, you know, you, you had a small coalition of members. Um, uh, Tim Burchett from Tennessee is someone who's been very good on this issue. He, he decries, you know, he calls the military industrial complex a bunch of war pimps. Um, 
you, you, you had a small coalition to, at the very beginning that you have 20 something members. By the time that they were voting on Ukraine spending in the last couple of weeks, that number had grown to about 100 members of, the co- of, of that conference. Now, again, that's still a minority relative to full numbers, but it was, it was about, it was almost to a 50-50 split. Um, and of course, Democrats all on board, Senate, you know, you have Mitch McConnell out there saying this is the most pressing, you know, issue for American interest and yada, yada, and the like. What's interesting is that, and again, all this could change in a heartbeat, right? You know, we should always expect it to, uh, the, the, the war machine will continue to, to fund itself. But all of the reports right now with the debates going on over who will replace Kevin McCarthy, the consensus is that further spending is on Ukraine is one of the biggest losers in the fallout here. Um, several of the leading uh, people that have been voiced as a potential replacement for Kevin McCarthy which includes Jim Jordan, um, and it includes the, the leader of the Republican Study Committee, um, Tim Hearn, uh, who's a kind of interesting guy, made all his money with uh, McDonald's franchises, and he was actually part of the original vote uh, against Ukraine funding, which again, I, hey, I'll, I'll take, I'm sure bad on plenty of other issues, but I'll take that. Um, there is a, a strengthening view that Ukraine funding, which again, McCarthy had already made this deal. This was going to happen. Um, it was not allowed, to, that process was not allowed to start up because of Gates's motion to vacate, but that that deal is essentially right now off the table. Now, you can't even vote on it until you have a new Speaker of the House, all that procedural stuff. But right now, it looks like anybody who becomes, the, 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 the betting odds right now within D.C. is that whoever is going to take up the speakership position, where you have a lot of members of the Republican conference that were not in favor of removing Kevin McCarthy for a variety of reasons. Again, Thomas Massey was on the McCarthy camp. Um, part of that is because, you know, and I don't fault him for this. Thomas Massey has, has more, had more influence with the deal set in place that, that allowed McCarthy to take leadership than he's ever had in Congress, right? So if, if, if you want a stronger Thomas Massey, then Kevin McCarthy had delivered on a stronger Thomas Massey, still minority views from the broader conference and the like, but that's why you had people who, you know, Matt Gates and Thomas Massey are kind of usually allies on most legislative battles, particularly the big ones when it comes to military spending, when it comes to you know, defense issues broadly. They were on different camps because both of them had different relationships with McCarthy. Um, and so you're, right now, it looks like if nothing else, one victory is that uh, the, the Ukraine skeptic caucus is going to be very difficult to be won over with whoever comes next. Now, one of the concerns out there, and this is, you know, you know, this is one of the arguments that, again, like a, a Thomas Massey used in defending um, and, and, and opposing a motion to vacate is the concern, the specter, that you're going to have a deal done where enough Democrats join with, let's call it the moderate caucus within the um, within the Republican ranks, and that therefore you could have a rise out of this sort of a dark horse, you know, pragmatic, bipartisan agreement, which again, as all of our listeners know anything, anytime you hear bipartisanship coming out of DC, you know, you're getting screwed over. Um, that's the one thing that could change that calculation. Right now, as, you know, as, as, as we record this, there's not an obvious candidate within that. Um, so right now, we, it seems like the Ukraine, you know, preventing future Ukraine spending is in a strengthened position now than it was last Sunday. Um, so that's, that's a small victory. We'll see how long it lasts, but that, that process has been made more difficult based off what's happened this week. So that would be an actual minor victory, it seems. And it's fun to watch just how rapidly the hysteria, the pro-Ukraine hysteria has deteriorated just in <laughs> really uh, 18 months. Um, where you were just supposed to, we were talking about boots on the ground, and uh, this was the the next great fight for freedom, and uh, now a, mi- a, a minority of Americans care at all uh, about continuing to fund Ukraine, especially while crime surges in the U.S., we're on the cusp of a recession, and we're all supposed to care deeply about a country in Eastern Europe that few Americans could find, which has clearly nothing to do with uh, American independence or safety, uh, unless you're just an absolute nutty 
um, ideologue like Bill Kristol, who's literally now paying for TV ads to tell Republicans that uh, giving money to Ukraine is a great deal and that it's containing uh, Russia, which ridiculously also, he also says that containing Russia uh, also serves to contain China, which no, uh, making Russia an ally of the West would have contained China much more effectively, assuming you think containing China is an important goal. And so this this seems to be the rap, at least within the right among uh, Republicans, conservatives, whatever you want to call them, it's now being rapidly pro-Ukraine is now clearly the minority position. But now that the Democrats, like in FDR style, are now the warmonger party, um, it's interesting to see that there and and uh, how they're, how the Senate is going to react, I suppose. I can't see them getting away with cutting off funding entirely because the Senate will just demand something. But uh, I think this is just the next step on the way toward uh, funding for Ukraine just being ratcheted down over and over again. And then once the recession hits in here, people simply are not going to care much about Ukraine at all. But we're talking dozens of billions of dollars each time the funding is upped, right? So that doesn't, even if that's eliminated, it's it does nothing about overall spending, right? <laughs> as, as has been pointed out, um, the since the last change to the debt ceiling, quote unquote, which of course is not really at all, and now it's been effectively suspended for uh, the midterm, it, they've added $2 trillion in debt in like six months, six or eight months. And this is just remarkable. Now it's up at $33 trillion. It will soon be uh, $35 trillion uh, sometime next year, most likely. And I mean, it's just, it's difficult to see any significant reigning in of this at all. And so when we look at that, I mean, that larger picture, is that just really the reality? That until some sort of historical reality changes significantly to make people just really throw in the towel on federal spending, I suppose, um, as it becomes clear that inflation is high because of ongoing deficit spending, um, that uh, the prices continue to spiral upward. Uh, the yield on government bonds gets increasingly unmanageable, and debt service continues to eat away more and more at Social Security and Medicaid and Medicare, which is coming uh, as we now are spending, it uh, looks like, over a trillion dollars then on debt service. I mean, that's what the future holds, is spending more and more on debt and less and less on these social programs that... Uh, the public demands, I, I, what What are they going to do? There, there seems to be no plan whatsoever for actually reigning in spending overall. Yeah, they're fighting over Ukraine spending, and that would be great if they ended that. But I don't see anyone voicing any sort of real strategy here for addressing just runaway trillion-dollar deficits that we're being told are, are occurring during a non-recession period. And when the U.S. is not in any is not actually directly involved in any major wars, so I mean, just imagine what's going to happen when recession hits, and we're and we're told they need to uh, start massive amounts of spending uh, to get the economy going again. I mean, I just I, <laughs> I I don't see that this Congress has any sort of ability to address that issue whatsoever. Right. I mean, we're looking right now. Within a month, we're going to go. Uh, from $33 trillion to $34 trillion. I mean, in a single day, um, you know, there's over a quarter a trillion dollar increase. <laughs> I mean, just the, the rate right now is outstanding. Um, and, and part of this, and this is what we've been warning on the show, we've been you know, talking about it at great length for, for years now, is Congress, and, and you know, I think this is true across the board, right? Um, you know, low interest rates have been a global phenomenon, but legislators have been dealing on easy mode for, you know, over a decade, right? When they didn't have to worry about interest rate increases while continuing to pile on debt, it was a whole lot easier to kind of hide some of the real consequences here. But now that you have rising interest rates, 
um, that you know, no one saw as possible a you know, year and a half ago. You know, none of this was priced in. The, the pressure that the legislature is, is now facing, again, you know, how much of them really care about this. Obviously, we know, we know there's one set of aisle that won't even pay lip service to the issue. You know, there's, there's very few members of Congress interested in doing anything. There's a lack of political will to address anything. Getting spending back to pre-COVID levels is going to be a crisis level event in DC. There's no seriousness to deal with this issue at all. But, but the rate of growth right now is astonishing. And again, this is what the number one, you know, this, this was the number one complaint made um, you know, during the, the arguments over McCarthy's leadership is that there's, there's absolutely no play in place. There's no vision. Um, there's, there's no attempt to even address this problem. And if you look at the makeup of the House conference, you know, the leadership of Kevin McCarthy, and I'm, 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 I, I think taking down Kevin McCarthy was a, a step in the right direction. I think anytime you can get a scalp from these people, I mean, Kevin McCarthy is the embodiment of, you know, I mean, he, he's, he's a lifelong political creature. You know, he's been, you know, he started off in the state legislature. I mean, he's you know, for, for decades now, and his only job has been in the legislature. Um, you know, he was famously one of the, one of the young guns back when it was, you know, Eric Cantor and Paul Ryan and you know, Kevin McCarthy going to save the Republican party and make it a serious party again, you know, during the Obama years, all that sort of you know, nonsense. Um, you know, there was no, and you know, absolutely no, uh, uh, plan, no, no, even attempt to address this building issue. And again, now we're, now we're running, you know, for the foreseeable future, again, two and a quarter trillion dollar deficits every single year. Um, and interest on the debt is, is, is you know, fast approaching the largest line item uh, budget, you know, that, that America's going to face. And, you know, if you look at the, the unseriousness of the modern Republican Party, it was on full display last week during the uh, presidential debate, which I hope most of our uh, audience did not subject themselves to. I'm a, I'm a masochist when it comes to political issues, so I watched the entire thing. And, you know, they, of course, you know, you, you, everyone wants to blame it on Biden. You had a few people pointing out that, you know, Trump has involvement there as well, which good, fine. Um, you know, some ownership of bipartisan consensus. Of course, you know, Ron DeSantis is going to point to his own record when he was in Congress and his votes there, but fine, whatever. Step in the right direction. The problem is, is that the Federal Reserve didn't come up until I think the last 20 minutes of the debate. And it was a few throwaway lines, one from Vivek Ramaswamy, who too is a defense has talked in, in greater detail about the Fed in the past. But, you know, he talked about you know, the need to change Fed leadership and, and you know, changing some of the mandates from the Fed. DeSantis had a, a short line about, you know, money printing being part of the problem. Okay, fine, whatever. But there's no, no awareness at all from the Republican side that on top of these physical issues and just the runaway numbers, and I think part of the problem is that numbers have gotten so high, they've been so high for such a long period of time. I don't blame average Americans for kind of becoming, you know, immune to it, right? There's the shock value has gone away. Um, so fine, but we were on the precipice of a, of a major credit event in, the, in this country right now. I mean, you know, the stock market was tanking yesterday, um, had nothing to do with Kevin McCarthy. What's interesting is that financial markets after the, you know, after we, we, we avoided the, 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 the devastation of a government shutdown, right? You didn't see any sort of, of you know, response in financial markets of you know, kind of projecting, oh, at least we've got some new confidence here, right? Get the grownups are in charge. And no, I mean, we, we are dealing with, with runaway events right now. What's the, the pressure that's going on with the Japanese yen? Um, I mean, the, the, the euro is in a major, major crisis here. And so, you know, this would be a time where if the Republican Party wasn't the stupid party, this would be the time where you'd go out there and being bold and kind of raising the, the warning signs like, look, we are on the precipice of a major crisis and we've got to do something serious right now and project some sort of forward thinking. I'm not expecting that at all. Right. I, I don't think you know, there, there is, I think, no one that is in contention for leadership right now that has those chops to them. Um, but again, like this, this is not a, you know, the, the Kevin McCarthy or the, the, the drama in DC and you, you, have, you have all these conservative pundits, right? You know, attacking Matt Gates for being a, a narcissistic opportunist that is using, uh, you know, this stand to fundraise as if that is, you know, <laughs> that, that, you know that's shocking in yeah. Washington that you have people with egos fundraising off of uh, what they're doing in DC. I mean, absolutely, you know, deplorable behavior out there. 
you know, the, the, you had members of Congress crying, weeping over Kevin McCarthy. You had members of Congress talking about how this is a, a tragic event in the history of the body. Meanwhile, the world is burning down around them. They're, they're more concerned about, you know, the feelings of Kevin McCarthy that yeah, admittedly wrote them a bunch of, of nice campaign checks that they relied upon. But that is the focus right now. Congress is, your, your average Republican staffer is more angry at Gates for kicking out Kevin McCarthy than they are concerned about these underlying issues that affect everyone in the country. Well, this is, of course, a frequent characteristic of an out of touch ruling class. Uh, you read it all the time about these uh, uh, monarchs of old who are absolutely convinced that the people will rush to their defense uh, in, in case of a revolution. It's, only, it's always just a tiny disgruntled group that doesn't like the king and the people overall love me. And then while they're uh, fleeing for their lives dressed as a woman in a uh, carriage somewhere, they're shocked, shocked to find out that they're either hated or that the public is indifferent toward them. And it's because these people are more worried about their palace coups and their other nonsense at court and who's having an affair with who and uh, who managed to get control of uh, some, uh, some new little responsibility somewhere within the government, that, which they all highly value. Meanwhile, the majority population is on the brink of uh, losing their house or defaulting on their debts and just generally their lives being made miserable. Oh, but you know, the great, great McCarthy has been thrown out of office and the, the wonderful traditions of our Congress are, are, be, are being challenged. I mean, nobody cares. Nobody cares about your stupid traditions in Congress. And let's, uh, let's, just, let's just recognize these people for the emotional basket cases they are and the ignoramuses they are. I mean, part of the reason they never talk about the Fed is because they don't care and it's too complicated for them. They don't understand. I mean, you and I both see, I saw it at the state level, you saw it in Congress, how anytime there was any sort of finance bill that came up, uh, you had like two people testify. And uh, a tiny number of people were actually interested uh, in it, and uh, there was it was all just agreements made beforehand, and there wasn't really much grandstanding. Uh, but anytime there was something to do with social policy or something that uh, the rubes in Congress could understand, well, they had immense opinions to express about it for hours on end. And it was because you don't need to have any particular knowledge to have an opinion about whether abortion is good or bad. Uh, whereas if you were going to have a, uh, a debate about Fed policy, you might actually have to read a book. And so nobody in Congress is going to do that. And I mean, that's just the reality. They don't understand what the Fed does. They don't understand why it's bad. They don't understand uh, the relationship between deficit spending and inflation and bond yields and all of that stuff. That's all just too complicated. The only thing these people know how to do is fundraise and get reelected. They have no other skills whatsoever, with a few exceptions with some people who actually had real jobs uh, before they came to Congress uh, less than 30 years ago. And I mean, nothing can just demonstrate just how much contempt these people deserve than the current situation that, yeah, the house is burning down around them and they're concerned with the piddling little internal politics of Congress. Uh, and we all saw it coming, too. I was pointing out on Mises.org back in 2019 that uh, Trump was running near trillion dollar deficits in a, t in a period where it was a major expansion, uh, where we were all the indicators were that the economy was great. And yet they were still running uh, 800 billion, 900 billion dollar deficits. And it was clearly in 2020, whether there were whether COVID had ever happened or not, it was going to top a trillion dollar deficit for no reason whatsoever, other than the fact that the Republicans and Trump love to spend huge amounts of money. And we're supposed to believe that that's Biden's fault, it's Democrats' fault. We can look back when the Republicans had total control in 17 and 18, what the realities were. Tons of spending, no regard whatsoever for fiscal responsibility. And so anyone who's still claiming that, and I saw this uh, in the most recent issue of Imprimus, you know, that Hillsdale sends out, um, that, uh, well, here's, a, <laughs> I have it sitting right here. They, uh, they, gave a, they have a graph in here. It's changes in wages versus change in inflation. And it's a graph. 
And it shows how uh, price inflation, it's a CPI, it's not money supply inflation, CPI inflation. Uh, look, during the Trump era, inflation was low and wage growth was high. But as soon as Biden comes in, well, then suddenly inflation goes up and uh, wages start to moderate and, and can't keep up with inflation anymore. And they're at what, so what the argument here is, is that everything was fine under Trump and the inflation that's now incurring, occurring in the Biden era has nothing to do with anything that occurred under Trump, that it's strictly Biden's fault. I mean, this is, I mean, this is a primus. This is supposed to be like some sort of high brow, more scholarly thing by some guy named Andrew Pudsger. Pudzer, Puzder, there you go. I don't know. I've never heard of him before, but he's supposed to be some sort of like economist. And I mean, the level of stupidity you have to have to think that what Trump did in terms of deficit spending and money printing during his time period had nothing to do with what was going with what's going on now uh, during the Biden era in terms of inflation. Uh, it's just astounding. The the obtuseness uh, is does he really believe this or is he just trying to pander to the even more ignorant readers claiming that the economy was well managed during the Trump years. But I, we continue to have that right. The Republicans are just going to say, hey, it's uh it's Biden's fault. Just get Republicans back in there. Even just those mainstream Republicans, guys like McCarthy and everything will be under control again. I mean, there's something deeply rotten within both parties, of course. But I guess they can just get away with it by blaming the other guy indefinitely. And I guess we'll know more when we see who's actually going to try and uh, run uh, for leadership here. But even most of the guys I see who seem relatively better in terms of GOP leadership, they still just tend to be bad on fiscal issues. Most of all that stuff you see on YouTube where they're, they're questioning the FBI um, and uh, scoring points on the left in terms of social policy or the corruption within the federal government. Uh, good, I mean, I'm glad they're doing that, that's great. But these people have shown zero will when it comes to actually doing something about the economic realities that are inflicting pain upon Americans. So you could see the economy just going down in flames as they're focusing mostly just on the FBI. Uh, under Biden. And then, of course, if you get a Republican in the White House, then most of that's going to disappear. They're not going to be criticizing the FBI nearly as much, if at all, when there's a Republican in charge. So it's all just going to go back to normal. And so it's this usual scam of each party saying it's the other guy's fault, uh, vote for us, and then and then everything just, uh, then the regime just gets supported again by whoever's in power once they're in. So um, I, <laughs> something, there's got to be some sort of significant political or historical event that would seem to change the, the public's overall views on these, but I haven't seen evidence of that quite yet. And that's part of it is that the public, you know, is, is you know, there, there's no appetite there for you know, any, any major physical reforms either, right? You know, you had, you know, when Paul Ryan was the, the budget wonder kid on the Hill and promoted as, you know, the, the, the serious wonk, um, you know, he proposed some very minor insufficient reforms to, you know, Medicare, Medicaid spending, and he was immediately, you know, portrayed as someone, you know, as you know, a guy throwing grandma and grandpa off a cliff. You know, I have no, no sympathy, no love for, for Paul Ryan. I mean, he was, his entire mystique was, uh, you know, only, pro you know, only possible in a, a town as, uh, <laughs> As, as cartoonish as DC, but it, but it was effective. And ever since then, you know, there's been no, you know, serious conversation about any, anything um, when it comes to the economic front. I mean, the Tea Party was, was completely co-opted. Most of the most fervent uh, pro-Trump crowd uh, largely consisted of former Tea Party members. You had, you know, uh, Mick Mulvaney, uh, who was Trump's head budget guy and finished up as, uh, you know, had, had a long tenure as the chief of staff. You know, he was a, a Freedom Caucus guy, and, and all of that went out the window because they saw Trump as a, as a vehicle for the, their own success, and there was, no, there was no wheels, there was no break there. Again, Paul Ryan, you know, Speaker of the House during those first two years in the Trump administration, nothing, you know, only succeeded in failing to, to make any sort of uh, reforms to Obamacare. Right, the, the number one issue that Republicans have been camp campaigning on for you know, eight eight years or so, um, and, and so so part of it 
is that you know for the few members of the house that are serious about you know that, that understand the gravity of the situation they're outnumbered there's no political will for voters to reward it i mean the the incentives there are completely disaligned for reasons our audience is very familiar with and if you look at you know what's going to come next you know someone who embodies you know, precisely your, your comments there would be someone like Jim Jordan, who, you know, I, I like Jim Jordan more than your average member of Congress. You know, he has been good on certain oversight issues and the like. Um, you know, but he, I, you know, I, I think it would be a mistake to suggest that, oh, he's changed Kevin McCarthy with Jim Jordan and suddenly you're going to get, you know, balanced budgets. I mean, that's, that's not going to happen. Um, you know, I think the more, most likely outcome right now is Steve Scalise, who's House Majority Leader, you know, most famous for getting shot by a deranged Bernie bro uh, a few years ago. Um, you know, he's not going to be some sort of radical. I mean, he's, he's arguably, he'll be, he'll be framed as more conservative than Kevin McCarthy, not a particularly difficult job. Again, how in the world you had a Californian representing the Republican Party is a whole different conversation there. And again, this, this kind of goes to, you know, what does it mean? Like, what, what is the skill set? that leads to someone becoming a Speaker of the House. And I think that's one of the issues, you know, one of the, one of the common criticisms out there, and, you know, I'm, I'm not going to comment on, on the validity or not, right? It's like, oh, well, the Democrats follow the leader, the Republicans don't. I mean, this is, again, pretty remarkable when you consider the last three Republican leaders have all been kicked out of their position, right? They, they, their, their terms ended in infamy. Boehner, um, uh, Paul Ryan, and now Kevin McCarthy. Um, and it's because you have this, this clear tension, this clear uh, divide between what the average Republican voter thinks. You know, there, there's, there's plenty of conflicts in there, right? You know, this is the crowd, you know, get, get, get your government hands off my Medicare, fine, whatever. You know, there, there's, there's some cognitive dissonance that exists throughout, you know, you know accepted within political d discussions, fine. Um, but the way that, that Republicans have governed have, has never been particularly favored by the base, the Republican base. And the issue is that the, 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 the system that leads to political power is, you know, your top priority is not being some sort of grand, um, you know, reformer in terms of, uh, you know, understanding policy and the like. It's how are you as a fundraiser? And so Kevin McCarthy, he was a great fundraiser. He was a person that, you know, when you had complaints going on there about big tech censorship and the like, he was the one going to, to Google and Facebook saying, don't worry, I'm gonna keep my crazies under control, keep sending me campaign checks, I'm gonna dole them out, you're gonna strengthen my position. I mean, this is a guy that was spending, he was very active in Republican primaries, axing conservative members in favor of people that he could control. Uh, Eric Brakey um, up in Maine, right? You know, Kevin McCarthy was spending Republican dollars to attack him when he was running for Congress, ended up losing the seat. You know, again, if you look at 2022, uh, you know, Kevin McCarthy took credit for, oh, well, we fired Nancy Pelosi. Well, if you actually look at the breakdown, Republicans lost most of the battleground seats. The big changes came from two singular states. It was New York, where you had a particularly competitive governor's race um, that ended up having spillover effects in con congressional districts. There's a few members, I think there was four Republican members, one in New York, and then you had four, one in Florida because DeSantis kind of changed the map um, to make it so there was more kind of red areas that, to win there. So like all of the, the makeup that gave Republicans a short majority came from those two states that had very little to do with Republican leadership. Um, and so like there, there was no forward vision. There's, there's no even, you know, I, I think Republicans are rightfully demoralized about what does national politics even mean right now when it doesn't matter who we elect. You know, we, we, we tried the Tea Party thing. It didn't work. We tried Trump. We're in the situation we are right now. Again, obviously, still a lot of, of love and loyalty to Trump is what it is. You know, so it goes. But you know, there, there is, I think, a sense that it doesn't matter what Republicans do, the federal government's going to continue to swim left. And so I, I think what's going to be interesting is what does this look like in terms of Republican focus in the future? And what's interesting is that some of the members that have, you know, the, that, that have been more willing to buck leadership in the past, a number of them are looking to leave D.C. for state capitals. Dan Bishop in Michigan, no relation as far as I know, um, is looking at running for attorney general in Michigan. Um, Matt Rosendale from Montana, he's looking at running for, for governor 
uh, or uh, for, for, for you know, larger, larger office within Montana. Matt Gates is you know, highly rumored to be running for governor in 2026 in Florida. And I think what you're going to have is the people that actually give a damn, who actually have concerns, are going to be leaving D.C., where there's nothing going on and ending up at the, the state level. And, and that could be, again, you know, I, I think that movement towards kind of post-national politics, um, which I think you'll see break out in a big way if 2024 does not go in the Republicans' direction. And let's be honest, with all the headwinds, all the economic headwinds that the Biden administration is facing right now, if Republicans can't win a national race, um, again, you, can, you can blame Trump, you can blame whatever, but it is what it is. Um, Main voter fraud and whatever, but like if, if you do not have Republicans successful at a national level with all the economic dysfunction, which again, I think we can, you know, be, you know, we're not in the prediction business, but I would predict that things are going to get worse between now and next November, um, then that hopefully will lead to very serious considerations on what does post national politics mean for an American right, how you want to define that. And I think that's where things start getting interesting because again, Washington is structured in a way that is, it's not meant to solve these problems. These, there, again, there's no political will that exists here. The, the hope for, you know, you're, you're not gonna solve this with an election, right? These, 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 this is basic math, this is basic economics. I mean, until you have people seriously talking about defaulting on debt, when you, when you start having genuinely extreme conversations, um, and, and you know, if you, in, in some ways, right, breaking up the appropriations process and re returning to normal would be an extreme measure relative to how Washington has governed itself for 25 years, fine. What's gonna end up in those discussions, again, you're not gonna get you know, multi-trillion dollar cuts out of that process, but fine, whatever. Um, that would be an extreme step. Um, but you're not, you know, there, there, there is no, you know, there, there is no plan here to navigate out of this. Um, and again, the only thing that, that is helping Washington right now is the fact that this is a, a international crisis or else the internal struggles would be even worse than they are right now. Um, so again, until you have, you know, radical leadership at the state level start taking on these concerns very seriously, we're seeing a little bit, you know, Texas has done a lot of interesting things in gold. Wyoming has done some very interesting things in crypto and the like. You know, you, you, you are seeing interesting things talked about at the state level. You're seeing more things done at the state level than even in Washington. And hopefully there gets to a breaking point where, you know, there, there's enough of the, you know, conservative base, conservative voters that recognize states are the better solution than, you know, putting all of our, our eggs in the DC basket. Um, you know, that's, that I think would be a, a positive trend towards something of substance. Instead, you know, again, I, I fully expect that you know the, the next speaker of the house is more likely to be a Scalise, um, and, and part of that is just because like if Scalise moves up, then that creates openings for majority leader. So you know people can move up there. And then if the if the the whip moves up, then there's going to be a battle over who can be whip, right? So all, all these politicians again, the same people that were blasting Matt Gates for only looking out for his own career and his own ambitions, right? You know, these are the same people that are going to be making very calculated decisions on, you know, what opening. If I support this person, it creates an opening for my personal career to to go up, right? These th this is what every member of Congress is going to calculate, right? Um, I think I think that's the most likely outcome. And it's going to result in something resembling the status quo. You know, I'll, I'll take a scalp when I can get it. You know, and any time that you can make members of Congress cry because you beat up their good friend, Kevin McCarthy, just, just but think of, the, he, he, he said nice thing, he came to our weddings and he, he says nice things to our children and he's such a great guy. And it's like, well, you know, if, if that's your, your basis right now on um, what leadership looks like, then you know, you're, you're out of touch. Any system where someone like Kevin McCarthy has a more influence, a, 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 a larger place in the hierarchy than someone like Thomas Massey who actually builds things, right? That, that is a system that is, is fundamentally broken. And it works for the left because the left's hierarchy is always dictated by power and politics. That is under their entire worldview. If there's gonna be any sort of, of genuine conservative movement, it's gonna be something that rewards merit and talent and actual accomplishment over pure political capital. The Republican Party is nowhere close to this. Um, again, it's, it's systemically broken. Again, we still have a freaking Romney 
you know, running the, the, the national party, right? I mean, this, this is the complete dysfunction of the Republican Party on the national level. And again, I think our listeners understand that, but, you know, I think, they, they, I, I think Murray would be enjoying the chaos and disorder and, and members of Congress crying that we saw this week. And at the very least, we can, we can savor that moment. All right. Well, that, let's let that be it for this episode of Radio Rothbard. Uh, we will be back next week with a new episode, so we'll see you next time.